Picture this, it's 1947, the world's still reeling from World War II, and suddenly people are seeing weird stuff in the sky. But here's the crazy part, almost immediately everyone's thinking the same thing, Martians. What was it about Martians that had such a grip on the public imagination? It's true, the stage was set for quite some time before that. Okay, so walk me through this. How did this whole Mars obsession get started? Well, it goes back further than you might think. In the late 1800s, an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli, was studying Mars and observed what he called canali, which in Italian just means channels. Okay, channels make sense. Mars has those crazy dust storms, right? So people thought maybe they were seeing natural formations? That would have been logical, except canali got mistranslated into English as canals. And that, my friend, got the rumor mill churning. Suddenly, everyone's imagining a Martian civilization advanced enough to build these planet-scale waterways. Ah, so one little translation error sparked decades of Martian mania. Oh. It's amazing how these things take hold. Absolutely. And this wasn't just idle speculation. This kicked off serious scientific papers, wild theories, and a whole wave of Martian-themed stories and novels. So by the time 1947 rolls around, the idea of Martians wasn't just some fringe theory, it was already deeply ingrained in popular culture. It's like everyone was primed for a Martian invasion without even realizing it. Precisely. And speaking of invasions, this was also the era of mystery airships. Oh yeah, like those old-timey UFOs. Exactly. In 1897, America experienced its first big wave of these airship sightings. Now, many were probably just misidentified natural phenomena or even hoaxes, but of course, people couldn't resist blaming them on Martians. Of course. When you're looking for Martians, everything starts to look like a Martian spaceship. Exactly. Newspapers, even while poking fun, reinforced this connection between anything strange in the sky and Martians. It was a cultural touchstone. We actually found some hilarious examples of this in those old newspapers. There's this one from Missouri about a mule-like Martian animal found in a fire station, supposedly left behind by an airship. The description is so outlandish, they say it has long, crooked fingers and eyes that can't handle daylight. I mean, come on. It's obviously a joke, but it shows how deeply ingrained the Martian trope was. And those tropes were remarkably consistent. Like what? What were some of the other common themes? Well, Martians were almost always depicted as more technologically advanced, sometimes even spiritually superior. They were seen as observing us, maybe even judging us. It's almost like a cultural projection of our own anxieties and aspirations. That is fascinating. Yeah. Okay, this next one's one of my favorites. There's this story of a Kansas farmer who swore up and down that his calf was stolen by an airship. Can you believe that? And to top it off, a local newspaper later called him out as a liar. But that didn't stop the story from spreading like wildfire. It even ended up in countless UFO books and magazines over the years. You know, it's funny, but also kind of sad. This guy just wanted to be part of something bigger, something exciting, even if it meant making up a story about a Martian cow abduction. It speaks to the power of a good narrative. These stories weren't just about spaceships. They were about what those spaceships represented. The unknown, the possibility of something greater than ourselves, even if that something was a little scary. It's like those stories were weaving themselves into the fabric of how people saw the world. They weren't just reading about Martians. They were starting to believe, on some level, that Martians might be real. And it wasn't just happening in the world of fiction either. Our research turned up stuff about real-life scientists trying to make contact with Martians, right? <laughs> it really does. And it seems like back then, everyone was captivated by Mars. Like, even some big names in science were trying to make contact, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. You can't talk about this era without mentioning guys like Nikola Tesla and Guglielmo Marconi, right? Yeah. Those guys were like the Elon Musk and Steve Jobs of their time, weren't they? Yeah. Everyone hung on their every word. Exactly. And both of them were linked to these attempts to communicate with Mars, you know, using radio waves and whatnot. It's kind of mind-blowing, you know, thinking about these brilliant minds huddled over their equipment trying to catch a signal from Mars. It's like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. It really is. And the public ate it up. They were hungry for any sign that we weren't alone in the universe. It was a time of incredible scientific advancement, but also, like we talked about, a lot of uncertainty and fear. Yeah, the world was still trying to find its footing after the war, right? So this idea of Martians, this advanced civilization out there, it probably gave people a sense of hope, but also maybe a little fear, like, what if they're not as friendly as we hope? For sure. And that brings us to another big event that really cemented this fear of a Martian invasion in the public's mind, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast in 1938. 
Oh, man, that's the one where everyone thought aliens were actually invading, right? Yeah, it caused quite a panic. Well, the media might have blown it out of proportion a bit. Right. Fake news isn't exactly a new phenomenon, huh? <laughs> exactly. But even so, the impact of War of the Worlds was huge. It proved just how deeply ingrained this fear of Martians had become. It's like all these cultural influences, the scientific curiosity, the wild stories, the fictional accounts of invasions. They all came together to set the stage for the 1947 UFO frenzy. They sure did. And that's not even factoring in the world of pulp science fiction. Those stories played a major role, too. Oh, yeah. I'm always fascinated by the pulp sci-fi stuff. What was it about those stories that really got people fired up about Martians? Well, a lot of it goes back to one magazine in particular, Amazing Stories, and specifically its editor, a man named Raymond Palmer. Okay, what was so special about this Palmer guy? Well, he had this knack for tapping into the public's anxieties and weaving them into these outlandish but strangely believable stories. He often blurred the lines between fact and fiction so masterfully that readers had a hard time telling the difference. So he was kind of like the original conspiracy theorist, but in a fictional world. Uh-huh, you could say that. And one of his most famous creations was the Shaver Mystery. This was a series of stories written by a guy named Richard Shaver, claiming he'd lived among a race of, get this, underground dwelling creatures called Daros. Daros. Okay, now you got to tell me more about these Daros. Mm. What were they supposed to be? Some kind of underground monsters? According to Shaver, they were the descendants of an ancient, super advanced race. But get this, due to radiation poisoning or some other catastrophe, they devolved into these like malevolent, almost goblin-like creatures. Wait, so we've got these creepy underground dwellers with advanced tech. That sounds kind of familiar. Weren't the Martians often portrayed that way too? Bingo. Palmer was a master at connecting those dots. He presented these Shaver stories as totally true, often linking them to real scientific advancements of the time, like radar or rockets. He even suggested the government knew all about these barrows and their hidden cities, but was covering it up. Classic. It's like the blueprint for every conspiracy theory we know and love today. Totally. And the timing couldn't have been better. People were already on edge after the war, and here comes Palmer feeding them these stories about hidden dangers and government conspiracies. It's wild how those anxieties can warp our perception, you know? It's like we see what we're already afraid of. It's the power of narrative. And Palmer knew how to spit a good yarn. In his editorials for Amazing Stories, he'd drop hints about spaceships visiting Earth, fueling the fire even more. He even made this prediction once, almost as a joke, about a giant 200-mile-long spaceship appearing in the sky. Whoa, hold on. He actually predicted a massive spaceship. When was this? Before or after the 1947 sightings? Here's the thing. It was before. Just a few months later, bam. Kenneth Arnold has his famous encounter with nine disc-shaped objects flying near Mount Rainier. Coincidence. Maybe. But it's definitely pretty eerie, right? <laughs> it's like he planted the seed in people's minds, and then boom, it happened. Talk about the power of suggestion. Right. It makes you wonder how much our beliefs influence what we see, you know? Totally. Okay, but it wasn't just pulp sci-fi that was feeding into this fascination with the unknown, right? There were others, like, um, what was his name? Charles Fort, I think. Oh, yeah, Charles Fort. He wasn't specifically focused on Martians, but his work definitely contributed to this growing fascination with the unexplained. Remind me what he was all about again. He dedicated his life to collecting these bizarre stories and unexplained events, things that defied conventional explanations. He called them damned data. He even had this whole theory about Super Sargasso Sea, basically, this place where weird stuff goes to hang out, just waiting to plop down on Earth. Okay, that's pretty wild. So even though Fort wasn't necessarily saying aliens are real, his work helped create this atmosphere where people were more willing to entertain the possibility, right? Absolutely. And then there were groups like the Fourteen Society, named after Charles Fort, who continued his work by investigating strange happenings worldwide. It all fed into this sense that something big, something truly unexplainable was out there. It really does feel like all these threads we've been talking about, the canals, the airships, those pulp sci-fi stories, they all wove together to create this kind of expectation, you know? Yeah. Like people were almost primed for the 1947 sightings. It's like they'd been handed a script titled Martians Are Coming, and then, well, someone forgot to tell the actors the show was just a rehearsal. And who could blame them for thinking it was the real deal? For decades, they've been reading about Martians, hearing stories, maybe even hoping for contact. 
It wasn't just a fringe belief anymore, it was practically mainstream. It's like those canalies on Mars. What started as a simple misunderstanding snowballed into this massive cultural phenomenon. By the time 1947 rolled around, the idea of Martians was about as ingrained as, well, apple pie. And then, boom, Kenneth Arnold sees those flying disks near Mount Rank, and suddenly, it's not just a story anymore, it's front page news. Exactly. And remember, this is a time when people relied heavily on newspapers and radio for information. So when those outlets started reporting on flying disks and mystery aircraft, well, people naturally connected the dots. Especially with all that pre-existing Martian baggage they were carrying around. It's like those stories primed them to interpret anything unusual in the sky as, well, extraterrestrial. Precisely. It's like how today we might be quick to attribute anything strange to government drones or some secret military project. Our minds naturally reach for explanations that fit within the framework of our current cultural moment. That's like our own modern day mythology, isn't it? Oh. We've replaced Martians with shadowy government agencies and hidden technologies. Exactly. And those narratives are just as powerful as the Martian stories of the past. They shape how we see the world, how we interpret events, even how we react to the unknown. You know, going through all these old letters to amazing stories, it's amazing to see how these stories really affected people. It wasn't just entertainment for them. It was, well, almost like a belief system. Oh, absolutely. And those beliefs had real-world consequences. They influenced people's actions, their perceptions, even their relationships with each other. Some folks truly believed they were seeing spaceships communicating with extraterrestrials even before 1947. And those beliefs were reinforced by the stories they read and the communities they belonged to. It's a good reminder that sometimes the stories we tell ourselves can be just as powerful as any objective truth, maybe even more so. It's something to keep in mind, especially today in the age of information overload. We're constantly bombarded with stories, narratives, and perspectives, all vying for our attention, all shaping how we see the world. It's more important than ever to be critical thinkers, to question our assumptions, and to be open to the possibility that there's always more to the story than meets the eye. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, folks, that's it for our deep dive into the Martian craze that swept the nation long before 1947. It's a fascinating reminder that sometimes the most outlandish beliefs have the most human origins. Thanks for joining us, and keep exploring those dusty corners of history. You never know what strange and wonderful stories you might unearth.